bow with me in a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this moment, this time where we can come together and hear from heaven, hear your word, to hear what you have to say to us today. We thank you and praise you, God, for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the opportunity to be at your table to remember the cross. And Father, now as we submit to your word, as we sit on the, the teaching of your word, the preaching of your word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, would you do work in our hearts? Would you do work in our lives? That, that, that our time together might not be just out of routine, but Father, our time together might be life-changing. Changes, challenges, commission us, send us, use us, get glory through us. This is our prayer, this is our plea, and I pray, oh God, that you would build a hedge of protection around us now, that Father, the devil nor his henchmen can get in to cause distraction of any sort, but I pray, oh God, for tunnel vision, and that we would see you and you alone, and that we would hear your voice and yours alone, for it's in your name we pray, and all God's people said amen, amen, amen. amen. Join me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, as we celebrate this weekend of our nation's independence. We celebrate July the 4th and all that that means to us as Americans. We're excited about this opportunity to see what God has to say to us on a weekend like this. And every time we come back to these milestones in our nation's history, it ought to cause us to look not only around and not only back in history, but to look up. Because what God is doing through even the events that we face, even in our culture and our nation today, God is still very much active bringing about his ultimate plan for our lives. And that is what we want to center on this morning. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject Christianity in America. Christianity in America. As I said earlier, we are Christians in America. God has us here. We were born where we were born on purpose, by design, because God has a purpose for us here in the United States of America. And I, I would not want to be born anywhere else. I wouldn't want to be born in China. I wouldn't want to be born in Japan. I wouldn't want to be born uh, in Africa. I mean, there's all kinds of places that we could chose to be born. But, but, but I thank God I was born in America. Praise God for the opportunity to not only hear about it or read about it, but to experience freedom, to experience liberty as we have in America. No place like it. But I want you to understand this morning that God has us in America for a reason. And as we talked about on last Sunday, we are to be salt and light wherever we are. Wherever we come from. Wherever we find ourselves. And, and that's so important for you and I to understand and really grasp and take hold of today. Because many of us as Americans, and especially as African Americans, we, we have a different view of life. My job as a pastor and a preacher and a teacher is to bring us back to the biblical view so that we can have a Christ-honoring experience and really experience the power of God in our nation. And I don't believe it's too late. I don't believe time has run out. I told you last Sunday that there's coming a time where, yeah, the grace of God will not be like it is today. There's coming a time where, yeah, uh, we're going to die, and we're going to uh, roll on out of here. And guess what? It, the time for our influences will be over at that time. Uh, or there's coming a time when, the, when, when Jesus will return. And when he returns, he's getting us caught up. The rapture will take place, and we will be with the Lord. And guess what? When that takes place, uh, our ministry is done. Our influence is over. Our job has ended. <laughs> And, and, and I want us to understand that that, that is imminent. Yeah, yeah. 
I really want to keep that before us. And you say, Pastor, why do you keep saying that? It seems like it's, it's drawing a cloud over, over things. And it seems like it's gloom and doom. But no, it's not gloom and doom if you know Jesus. Amen. If I die, I'm going to be with him like Paul said. Oh, if I remain, listen, I can serve him. It doesn't matter how you slice the pie. We win and God gets the glory through our lives. Amen. So whether we die in this flesh or whether he comes back and takes us up, it doesn't matter. The job is still to be done. Yes. And I want all of us to really grasp this idea and the fact this morning that the reason you and I rose this morning and opened our eyes and experienced a brand new day is, the, is, 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 is a clarion call. It is a, procl- a proclamation to you and I that there is still work to be done. Yes. That there is still a job to do. Yes. God is not through. With you and I or America. And I believe that with all of my heart. If I didn't, I wouldn't waste my time preaching about it. Yeah, things bother me. Yeah, things get on my nerves. Yes, things concern me in our nation. But I want you to understand, as we go back to God's word, he is consistently telling us over and over again in so many different ways. And this will be one of those ways this morning. He's consistently and repeatedly reminding you and I of our purpose in the earth, of our purpose in America, of our purpose in Prince George County, of our purpose here in the state of Maryland. Please don't buy into this uh, uh, a comfort zone Christianity that if you just get your big house and you get your car of choice or if you get that dream job or you start making a certain amount of money that you have somehow plateaued out and you don't really have any concerns. Beloved, be very concerned if that's all you're concerned about. We are Christians in America. We are Christians in Maryland. We are Christians in Prince George County. We are Christians in D.C. We are Christians first. And that's the first thing I want all of us to understand. Without that being understood, the rest of this makes no sense. Because it will find no lodging place in our hearts until we embrace our purpose under God. God has a purpose for Christians in America. And I don't know what America, what role America will play in the end time events. Many have said they don't see traces of America in the book of Revelation. Many, 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 many have uh, just uh, concluded that this nation might not exist. I don't know. But I do know this. That God has a purpose and a plan right now. For the place that we call America, for the place, our our home, the place that we hold near and dear, the liberties that we enjoy Mm -hmm. and sometimes, yes, take for granted. And I want us to understand this morning that God wants us to understand and really wake up to this realization that if we don't uh, prioritize the, the gift and the freedom and the liberty that we enjoy today, it will not always be like this. It will not always be like this. So preacher, what should Christians do in America? Before I get into the text here in in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the general theme of this sermon this morning, this message, is going to center around the most important activity that you and I could ever do with our lives. So preacher, how, how should I spend my life? How should I order my day? How should I respond to this or that? In one word, I'm going to sum it up. Pray. Pray. The most powerful tool that we possess as believers is prayer. Prayer. The ability to touch heaven. The ability to talk with God. A communion with the creator and the sustainer of all that is. The, the, the best thing that we can do with our time is to pray. Because we're not praying to someone we don't know. 
You got to understand this thing before we get into it. We're not praying to a tree. We're not praying to some unknown deity. We're not praying uh, to the space. We're not praying, listen, to, uh, a waste of time. We're praying to the one who is our father. Yes. Yes. And just as confidently as you would walk up to your parents and, and, and commune with them and talk with them and make requests of them is the same way we walk into the presence of God Amen. as his children because he is our father. Amen. And he simply gives us an invitation more times than we take it to pray. Christians are called to a life of prayer. A life of prayer. This is not an event. Last Sunday, we, we paused in the middle of our service to have a, a special time of prayer for our nation. But let me, let, me, let me just get you to understand that that's not all of it. That's not it in its totality. We're not just called to events. We're called to a lifestyle of prayer. You and I ought to be men and women of prayer each and every day. So much so that Jesus, the, a, a great a, a, a great portion of his ministry centered around teaching others how to pray. Yes. Teaching his disciples how to pray. You know, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, it talks about the disciples' prayer, and he taught them how to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. And he goes on to model for them how we ought to talk to God. The most important thing that we can do with our lives is to develop a discipline of prayer. And not selfish prayer. Because I know that's where most of us go when we hear prayer. Oh, I, I've got an opportunity to talk to God about my issues. God, help us to grow up. God, help us to move past just what's in front of our nose. God, help us to get a, a larger sense of what really is at stake here and what the need is and why there's a call this morning to prayer. Not about, it's not just about a wish list. It's not just about my needs and my wants and my desires. It's about God's desires. It's about God's agenda. It's about God's program in the earth. And through you and I, he can accomplish that which he has ordained to take place if we will simply talk to him. So much bigger than God give me. God fix it. God help me. Yes, he will, but that's not the totality of our prayer life. There's much to pray for. We're going to see that in the text today. But Jesus taught his disciples how to pray because he knew they would need that. And guess what? You, as a, you and I as disciples of Christ need that today. Paul also teaches us not to worry, but rather he tells us how to pray. In Philippians 4, 6, he says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is what, what scripture over and over again teaches us. And matter of fact, Paul repeats this theme here in verse 8, the same chapter. He's talking about the leadership of the church, how they should set, set the example of prayer. In verse 8, he says, I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. There is, a, there is a pressure, there is a, an importance, there is emphasis placed upon prayer. Not sporadic prayer. Not emergency prayer. Y'all do understand what I'm talking about when I say emergency prayer. We know how to dial 911. We know how to get out of a fix. We know how to handle a problem that's too, too big for us to handle. We call on God. But when everything is fine and fair weather and there is no looming doom, guess what? We don't find ourselves on our knees with that same type of passion. But God says this has become a lifestyle of prayer. This is what makes it a lifestyle of prayer. There's three areas that I want to center on as we unpack how this lifestyle of prayer and how our involvement as Christians in our culture in our, in, our, in our nation can make a difference. Number one, here's the first thing that you and I ought to do. We need to cultivate an active prayer life. Cultivate an active prayer life. Now, here's the time where you take that bulletin you have, you turn it over, and you take a pen, and you jot these things down, because this is not a sermon. This is a message. You need to take this with you. 
cultivate an active prayer life. So important for each and every one of us as children of God to cultivate. If you're cultivating something, you take great care to, 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 to make sure it is, it is growing, it is, it is becoming, it is evolving into what it should be. And guess what? Our devotion life, our prayer life ought to be growing day by day, moment by moment, situation by situation, whatever it is. We ought to be cultivating a communion and prayer life with God. Not a, not a passive prayer life, but an active prayer life. A lot of things we've talked about, even as we looked at the Beatitudes, uh, we looked at meekness, we looked at all these things that seem to be passive in nature, but in reality, they're not passive at all. They're aggressive. And while God has called us to be self-controlled and controlled by the Spirit of God, he's not called us to be passive. Never does he call us to be passive. But rather, he calls us to be in, in a quiet way, in an unassuming way, aggressive towards the things that God has called us to do. Not as the world would wage war. We don't fight like they do. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. This is not a battle with sticks and stones. This is not a battle with guns and bullets. This is a battle that is fought on our knees. Amen. Talking to the one who's got the power. I want you to get this. Cultivate an active Prayer life. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 and 14 reminds us, as we saw last week, we are the salt of, and light of the world. Amen. You look at salt. Salt has to come in contact with what is decaying. It has to touch. Ooh, It has to touch what is dead, almost dead in nature, decaying, and what is decomposing so that it can have its effect on it yeah. as a preserver. Light has to be shown in darkness. Where there is darkness, that light has to be shown so that darkness will dissipate. It will go away. If the light and the salt never get into those scenarios, they never become what they were designed to do. They never accomplish what they were designed to do. And beloved, you and I are the salt of the earth. You and I are the light of the world. Jesus showed us how to shine he showed us how to intervene in the affairs of men and the cause, listen, of preservation. Listen, he calls us with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And what is the good news? The good news is that you don't have to die in a decayed state, but you can be born again. That's what God has called us to not only possess, but to give even to our world today. He says, you are salt of the earth, earth and light of the world. We must pray aggressively in order to do those jobs. James chapter 5 and verse 16, the last part of that verse says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yeah. Notice the first words, effectual fervent. Yeah. You get the idea of passion. Uh, no, 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 no casual attitude here. No, 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 just waltzing through and, and you know, God, I, 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 I'll talk to you when I get around to it. Or, or God, I, I, I'm not really concerned about this or that, but by the way, would you just do, you know, no, 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 no. no. It means that we are on our knees on purpose and for a purpose. And that purpose is to beseech heaven, to call down heaven, to believe God for his intervention. It doesn't matter what it is. God is greater than our circumstances. He's greater than our challenges, even in our nation. And God is so big, God is so mighty, and God is so strong. What does he want to do? He wants to show himself mighty in the earth. How does he do it? When you and I call his name in prayer. Fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Mixed with faith, the ability to believe God when you can't feel him or see him. To know that God will do what he said. To, to, to know that he'll do what he's promised. That's an effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. The Bible says it produced much, it availeth much. 
Thank, uh, first, Thessalonians, first Thessalonians 5, 17. Very short verse says, pray without ceasing. Would you say that with me? Pray without ceasing. One more time. Pray without ceasing. Over and over again, we're reminded of how important prayer is. Paul begins this chapter by exhorting believers to take prayer seriously in all areas of our lives. Look at the text. Verse 1 says, Therefore I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All men. I want you to understand that this active prayer life is so important because, because, because we are admonished here to listen, to pray not just for certain people or certain things, but we're called to pray for all men. They were false teachers in this day, and, and they, they were in the ears of some, and, 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 and they were saying that, listen, uh, you don't, no, no, no need to pray for the Gentiles because uh, they can't be saved anyway. There's only elite, there's only a certain few that will be saved, so no need to pray at this evangelistic type of prayer or to have this evangelistic type of outreach because they're not going to come to Christ anyway, or they're not going to be saved. Only a few, elite few can be saved, and it was a false ism in the body and and listen uh, we we understand from scripture here that this and this and Paul is admonishing us to pray for all people all people even the ones you don't like even the ones that get on your nerves even the ones you don't agree with even the ones that don't stand where you stand or believe like you believe listen we're called not to make decisions on who we pray for and who gets the blessing and who we ask God to help and who we ask God to intervene it, 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 no it has nothing to do with our likes or dislikes God says pray for everybody because we're not in this world by ourselves and what, what he's about to tell us in this text is listen that there are <laughs> Or there's a reason why we pray for all men. No one's excluded. First he tells us who to pray for. All men. But then he, he tells us secondly how to pray for all men. He says, listen, go back to the first part of, uh, part of the verse. He says that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made. That's what he says. Yeah. How do you pray? There's, there's, there's different types of prayers here. Supplications, it comes from a Greek word, term meaning to, to lack or to, to be deprived or to be without. So, so we're thinking of and getting the idea of request, needs or requests. And we're all acquainted with needs and requests. But he says, let, let, let pray uh, bringing these requests before the Lord. Because God knows what we stand in need of. And the greatest need, listen, even in this text and even in our world today, is not resources or material thing or, or other uh, temporal, temporary blessings. Uh, the greatest need that we have in our culture today is that men and women would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our world can have economic success. We can have political structures and big government and all these things that, that people strive for today. But let me tell you something. All those things mean absolutely nothing if people don't have a proper relationship with Jesus Christ. So what, 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 we're, what, what we're admonished in this text to understand is that prayers for all people include requests. Supplications. Secondly, he says prayers. This is a general term. All kinds of prayers. And you and I are, can identify with this because it doesn't mean that when we have a dilemma in our lives, that that's just the time we pray. But as we read in scripture, we ought to always pray. First Thessalonians says we ought to pray without ceasing. And since that is the case, whether it's a good day or a bad day, whether it's a stressful time or whether it's a time of peace, prayer is prayer. We ought to have a discipline of praying under any circumstances and for any reason. In other words, God ought to hear us talking to him on a regular basis. God ought to hear us and, and see us on our knees on a regular basis. 
And I, I realize that times have changed and most of us were taught as children growing up, get on your knees when you pray and get in a posture of prayer. Get in a, get in a, a place of prayer and, 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 and humble yourself and exclude everything else and talk to God. Somewhere along the line, we've lost that quality of praying. And I know you can pray anywhere. You can pray on your, in, in, in the beltway on your car. You can pray on, on your job. You can pray in your bathroom. You can pray, listen, when you're laying down. But listen, don't lose the ability to get on your knees. Amen. To shut off the radio and to lay down the cell phone and to turn off the television and, and, and spend quality time just with the Lord. Nothing beats it. Nothing takes its place. You and I cannot afford to be too busy to really prioritize God in prayer. Prayers, all kinds of prayers. Make it your general time of talking to the Lord. But thirdly, he says intercession. Comes from a Greek word meaning to fall in with someone. To fall in with someone. To intercede, to, to, to take up the cause of someone else that is in need. Paul is exhorting us to pray with a heart of compassion for lost people. Again, we, we think of prayer as being centered around our needs and resources and supply this and do this. But, great, but the greatest need, again, that God wants to grant is that lost people come to know him. So as we intercede, we see the decay of our day. We see that's what salt does. It goes where the decay is. And, and as we go where that area of damage is and decay and demise is, we find ways to help it. And how do we help it? We don't have the answer in and of ourselves. But when we find a decaying situation, guess what a, a child of God does in America? Christians in America, they don't complain. They don't bellyache. They don't get depressed. But they take that area of decay and they lift it up before the Father and they say God would you intervene in this situation this man this woman's about to die without life without faith in Christ would you reveal yourself to them in a way they can receive you intercede fall in in other words don't become a part of the problem but go in with the answer to the problem and that's what God has called you and I to do today to intercede on behalf of those that cannot call on God for themselves we think of people that are in need. We think of paupers. We think of poor people. We think of people that have no resources. We think of people that are, that are without uh, resources and these things. But that's not necessarily the case. There are a whole lot of people in our nation today that are driving around in Bentleys and Cadillacs and all kinds of cars and living all kinds of lavish lifestyles. Uh, listen, who are in need. Many of you, you see on your television, they're behind the camera. They're presented as being successful. Amen. Successful. But let me tell you something. They are poor in the eyes of God. They are paupers when it comes to the kingdom agenda. And when it comes to the gospel, they know not our God. And they need the body of Christ, you and I, to wake up from our religiosity, to wake up from our Christianity that is dead and dormant, and to take the case before the Father. Intercede. When's the last time you've been burdened about someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ? How badly does it weigh on your heart? To see someone come to Christ or to profess to come to Christ and walk away from God as if they never made a commitment to him. How, how, how does it weigh on your heart to see somebody play Russian roulette with their soul and, and with, their, with, their, with their eternity? How, how, how deeply does it move you? Many of Christians today are not moved at all. Because we pray so little. And let me tell you something. We pray about what's important to us. And the sad commentary is that most of our prayers are centered around ourselves. But he wants us to intercede on behalf of someone else. The fourth thing he says is thanksgiving. 
prayers of gratitude for God's goodness and mercy. You, you never end without thanking God and praising God for who he is and what he has done. So what he, he's admonishing us to understand here is that you and I, listen, need to have an active prayer life for all men, no matter who they are, because God has a purpose for us in the midst. Look at verse 2. For kings and all who are in authority. For kings and all who are in authority. Second part of our message this morning, point number two, commit to pray for these for those in authority. Yes. Commit to pray for those in authority. God has us in America, and God has blessed America, not necessarily because America has been a Christian nation. And I know that, that that's been used uh, so freely in our past and even, even our present day. But America has never been a quote-unquote Christian nation. Yes, there have been those in our nation's history that have had a, a reverence and respect for God. Uh, there have been those leaders that have held uh, uh, God in his rightful place as the one worthy of worship. And, you know, we praise God for Christian and saved uh, political leaders. But America, even today as we look around, has become a place for all religions, for all faiths, all belief systems. Uh, and Christianity, while we have uh, professing believers and those that know Christ as a Savior in America, yes, this is a hub for the gospel to reach around the world. But I want you to understand that there is a very much secular culture amongst us. There is very much a carnality, not just in a uh, 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 Challenged areas economically. No, not just in drug infested neighborhoods. Uh, no, no, no. But in political arenas, there is a decay that is taking root. That is pulling our nation further and further. We no longer have a reverence for what is holy. We no, we no longer have a reverence for things that are right and pure and just. We no longer have respect for the things of God. Whether we fully understand it or not, there's not even a casual glance towards what is right and just and holy. That's why he tells us we're to pray for our authorities. We're to pray for our political leaders. Political leaders are either loved or hated. They're loved or hated. That's, that's really the summarization of it. You love them, you vote for them, you hate them, you don't. That's how we do politics. But you know what? Many are loyal to their political parties, but beloved, let me tell you this. We're not Democrats nor Republicans first. We are Christians first. And in verse 1, Paul exhorts. He uses that word. He urges, he exhorts. He admonishes us. To stop taking sides and to start taking our leaders to the Lord in prayer. That's the most powerful thing you and I could do in America besides living our faith out is to take our leaders to the Lord in prayer. Whether they profess to know him or not. Because here's the thing. God is the originator of government. God is the one that originated this whole thing. It's not man-made. It's not a man-made system. It's a God-made system. Amen. And listen, even though it's flawed and it seems to be broken in some areas, God still has a purpose for government in the world today. And let me tell you something. Say, preacher, what is that? I don't know what it is. Uh, let me tell you what it is. It, it, government, it, listen, a flawed, bad, uh, evil government is still better than anarchy. Amen. That's right. Amen. The absence of government. The absence of, of, of rules. Uh, Government is still in place because God still has a place for it. Yeah. And we're called to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our president. Yeah. He's rounding up his term and we need to pray for, for our president. We need to pray for Barack Obama. Yeah. We need to, whether you voted for him or not, whether he's your candidate of choice or not, we need to pray for him. Yeah. Why? Because he's in the position that God has created. We need to pray for his safety and his protection. Yes. We need to pray for his guidance and leadership. Yes. We need to pray for our moral understanding and sound judgment. Yes. Because God is still the one ultimately sovereign over any ruling authority. Yes. We need to pray for all those under his care. 
So why is it important for us to pray for our authorities? Verse 2 says, pray for authorities, kings who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. I want you to get this. That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. This, is not, this, is, this does not mean a stress-free, middle-class life. Right. That's not what he's saying. But rather that you and I can have, a, have favor with ruling authorities so that you and I can live out our faith so others can see God in our lifestyle. Yes. You say, preacher, is that possible in the world we live in? Yes, it is. Amen. Yes, it is. <laughs> God will give us the ability to be and to do what he's called us to do with the time that he's given us to do it. God will not take us home a minute too soon. Do you understand what I'm saying? He will not call us home a minute too soon because he wants us to fulfill our calling and purpose in the earth. He's on schedule. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan. And he's sticking to his plan. And you and I are, listen, praise God, we're part of his plan. And we're not going to be, listen, raptured or we're not going to be called home until we've done what he's called us to do in his plan. The preacher, well, how, how can we live a life that way in a world that is so decaying and so, so wicked and evil and vile in nature? Because God ultimately controls those that are in authority. And I want you to understand this. This is where, this is where he throws the ball back in our court. See, we want to think it's all about the politicians or voting or, or having influence out in the street. But that's not where the battle's won, beloved. Understand what the text is telling us today. What God is trying to get us to understand is that the changes that are needed in our culture don't happen on the streets. They happen in our hearts. They happen in our habits. They happen in our dedicated lifestyle to God in secret prayer. Happens when no one else is watching. But God sees. He sees. The Amplified Bible reads it this way. He says that outwardly we may pass a quiet and undisturbed life and inwardly a peaceable one in all good godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. That quiet life that he's talking about is, is the absence of external disturbance. But the second thing he says is peaceable That's talking about an internal peace. So what is God calling you and me to do today? He flips it. Let's let's stop talking about the politicians for a minute, and let's talk about how we're living. Let's talk about how we live life. Because God wants us to exist not in a chaotic system. Yes, we're in a chaotic world, but we are called on assignment and we have to be under the controlling power of the Spirit of God at all times. This is no longer about what I desire or what I think or my preferences or what gets on my nerves. No, it's about what God is trying to do in me so that I can be ready to be used by him and effect change in the culture. Help us to live a a quiet and peaceable life so that we can be used by the Lord. Our testimony can be seen this way. And believers, we have a testimony that should be seen. And believers, we should not have a testimony that we're one way in the church and another way in the street. We should not have this aura and and this cloud over our head uh, that we say one thing and do another or that we profess one thing and go out and live another way. No, we ought to, listen, be uh, 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 consistently dedicated to the purpose of God for our lives. Because this is how we reach our culture. It's not by picket signs. It's not by demonstrations. It's not by all these outward external things. But it's by, listen, a life and a heart. That gets the point. And he wants our lives to be in order so that he can use our lives to effect change in the life of our culture. God help Christians to be Christians. God help us to stand up on the word of God and to simply do it. 
It's not about what we say or what we profess. It's not about how loud we shout and how loud we speak, but it's about what we do in our own personal lives. The reason why the world cannot be uh, won to Christ in certain areas is not because the world ha- has gone too far. No, it's because Christians haven't gone far enough. God wants us to go further in our commitment to him so that he can use our lives to draw other people to Jesus Christ. Many times our lives are testimony against us. Many times our testimonies don't even help us. When people read us and they try to size us up, uh, we fail short of really what God has placed us here and called us to do. And we, we stick our own foot in our mouth time and time again when we ought to be doing what God has called us to do. And really seeing results. And yet, it is possible to see results in our day to day. It is possible to see change in our world today. But he wants us to live in such a way. God will grant us, his church, the time and the space to experience peace and favor so that our testimony might be evident to all. And that's what God wants to understand. Our fervent prayers for our government have direct impact in this area. Let me ask you a question. Are you praying? Are you fervently praying for our government? Are you praying for the issues of our day? Are you praying for our Supreme Court? Are you praying for those in authority that, that make this, the decisions? Are you praying even for the thing that has just happened in our nation with same-sex marriage? And are you, Is that a prayer item today? Is that something that we're putting on the altar before the Lord and saying, God, you are the supreme ruler of all, and God, would you intervene in the affairs of man? God, would you intervene in our lives and in our world today? Are we praying as a church? Are we praying as a people or are we ignoring opportunities to pray now's the time to be the church on our knees in the presence of God thirdly and finally you and I ought to believe God for spiritual awakening believe God for spiritual awakening I believe with all my heart that God is still able to open the eyes of the blind. I believe with all of my heart that God is able to soften the hardest heart. I believe with all of my heart that God still changes lives and saves people today. Whether it be in America or abroad, God still changes people. And as long as he still saves, As long as he still delivers, as long as he's still speaking, there can be an awakening. Right here in the United States of America. I'm not one to say there's going to be a last time uh, in the last days a great revival. I don't know. I pray God so. I don't know, though. But even if it just awakens one. Even if the truth of God's word gets the attention of one, it's worth it. Even if God can use us, ordinary people, on our knees, calling on heaven to intervene in the life of one, guess what? It's worth it all. If he can change the life of one child, that's why we do outreach. That's why we go out in the neighborhood. That's why we do VBS and Community Fund Day, because we're going after the one. I don't know many how, how many others, but I know God's got one at least one that he wants to transform. God can give us spiritual awakening. Verse 3, look at verse 3. For this good, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. He says it's good. It pleases God. That, that, that ought to be proof enough to get us on board. It's where God is. It gets God's approval. It it gets God's attention. And he's excited about the idea to pray like this, to intervene like this, uh, to call down heaven on behalf of those that are in authority over us. Why? Because as the body of Christ mobilizes in prayer, God begins to move over the political system to ultimately bring about his plan and his agenda so that we can do what he's placed us here to do. It's connected. If we don't pray, guess what? We get what we don't ask for. If we don't pray, we sit back and we let evil men do what they want to do. 
If we don't pray, if we don't have a priority in prayer, guess what? We have no right to complain about anything. We have absolutely no room to talk or speak or complain because we're not on our knees. You know what 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says? Listen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. It's all predicated upon the priority of the believer, of the children of God. How much of a priority? God will bring an awakening. God will illuminate. He's always saving. He's always delivering. He's always touching. But how much of a deal is it for you and I? It pleases God when we pray this way. Look at verse 4. It says, who desires that all men, what, be what? Saved. Saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Let, let, let me read that one more time. Make sure we all get this. He says, who desires all men, there it is, all men again, to be saved and to come to, a, to the knowledge of the truth. What is God's desire? It pleases him when we pray for the lost because his desire is for the lost. His desire is that all will be saved. He wants them to know him. He wants them to know the truth. It pleases God to save the lost. So much so that it pleased him to send Jesus so that the lost might be saved. Look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Listen, what, what, what we find is that not only does it please God to pray this way and it pleases God to save, but it pleases God to send Jesus. It pleased him to send Jesus to bring us salvation. Yes. The reason why you and I are here today and saved and on, my, on our way to heaven is because of a mediator. Amen. And the mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ. Yes. And the reason why we have the, the liberty, the spiritual liberty that we possess and enjoy today is because of the mediator that has come and mediated a, a dangerous and volatile situation. He's a preacher, what are you talking about? Listen, you and I, a, me, a, me, a mediator is someone who comes in between two parties uh, at the way there's a conflict in nature. You do realize there was a conflict in nature because we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity and that was the conflict that we were birthed into and we needed somebody who was outside of that but who could come in and, and intervene and mediate and bring us into a right relationship with God the Father. Because sin separates us from God. Sin always has separated us from God. But what Jesus came to do was bring us in fellowship with God. Because he eradicated and forgave our sin that we might have everlasting life. I'm glad this morning for the mediator. I'm glad I know Jesus for myself because he has mediated in my life. And now I have brand new life. Facts are clear. We're born in sin. The facts are clear. The payment of sin is death. The facts are clear. Salvation is not of works. The historical facts are clear as well. This, this weekend, going back to 1776, the beginning of a brand new nation. Even going, coming back further to 1863, we acknowledge the Emancipation Proclamation, which what? Uh, speaks of the freedom of all the slaves. What a wonderful time. But, well, well, listen, beloved, uh, that's not the only good news. The gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. Jesus came to be our emancipator. He came to free us from sin. He came to give us brand new life. He came to give us, listen, a redeemer, a savior, a lord, and a master. He's not willing that any should perish. That's why we pray for all men. And verse 7 tells us, I close, he says, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. That's very plainly, listen, I was called for this. <clears throat> it pleased God to use a Paul, a Timothy. Guess what? God can be pleased to use us. I don't know who you are. I don't know where your heart is or your mind is today. 
But I can tell you this. If you simply dedicate yourself to him, he can use you just as he did in this apostolic age. He can anoint you and me with a heart of compassion that will first of all involve ourselves in prayer, praying for the authorities, and then being willing to be used. Because God can send a revival. God can send an awakening. In your home, in mine, in our families, in this neighborhood. I don't know what God's going to do this, this, this week of, of VBS. But I know God wants to awaken some child. And I know God wants that child to go back and tell their parents. And I know he wants to wake them up spiritually. And I want you to be ready to be used. That he might use you and me. Because it pleases him. It gives him glory to use us in that way. And as we said on last Sunday, let me tell you something. As we seek the kingdom first, all these other things will be added unto you. As we're about our father's business, he'll take care of ours. That's what Christians should be in America. And that's how we ought to approach this even our present day. We ought to be found on our knees. If it ever comes to a point where we're called, uh, pursued or pressured by, by political systems or by, 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 by force, and if we lose our freedom and if we lose the things that we enjoy today, may we be found in our homes, on our jobs, or in our churches, on our knees. May we be found being faithful in prayer. May we be people literally of faith, found talking to the one who can handle our authorities and bring change to our world. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Let me ask you this question as I close. Are you proud to be an American? Are you glad that you live in this land of the free? Are you willing to be used to protect that freedom? That battle's falling on your knees. That battle is falling on your knees. I challenge all of you, go back and read this text when you get home. Go, go back and read, read our justice in your spirit when you get home. Because I believe God wants to ignite a fire under us that will draw us closer to God in prayer. And whatever it is that's out of order, guess what? God can handle it. Whoever it is that's out of order, God can, God can fix them. Let's not become a skeptic and think that all is lost and there's no hope. As long as there's life, and as long as the body of Christ is in the earth, oh, there's hope. That's why you're here, and that's why I'm here. Would you just pray a simple prayer and say, Lord, God, use me. Use me. You know, it might take us getting on our knees more. It might take us getting in the Word of God more. It might take us becoming a student of the Word of God so that we can be rock solid in our faith and be able to stand like that. It's not for wimps. It's not for some type, you know, you know, this is not, you know, sporadic in and out. No, no. This is for po- folk who are committed to God and have placed their lives in his hands. Would you simply ask him to use you in the quietness of this moment? God, use me. Use me. I've got a, vo- a voice. I've got a mouth. I've got a platform. I've got an opportunity. Use me. I want to be used so that you might be pleased with my life. Maybe you're here today and you never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You don't know if you're saved or not. You can be saved today. Salvation is simply believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, admitting that you're a sinner in need of this Christ. 
and then confessing him as your Lord and Savior. And he'll save you today on authority of God's word. And we sing God bless America, but God can bless you with eternal security right now. He can bless you with the forgiveness of your sins. He can bless you with everlasting life. Maybe there's somebody who needs to rededicate their lives to the Lord. You come today and rededicate your life. Get back on track. If you need to join this church, today is the opportunity. Right now is the time to make that known. Whatever it is, whoever you are, let God speak to your heart now. And would you respond in the affirmative and say yes to him? As we all stand to our feet, everybody stand on your feet everywhere. Whatever God has spoken to your heart, or maybe you need to come and pray, you come and do business with God. And let him speak and minister to your heart. As we sing a song of invitation. All to Jesus. Come on. All to Jesus. You come today. Is there one? Is there one? Preacher, pray for me. I need prayer. Salvation, rededication, membership, whatever it is, you come today. Is there one? Is there one? Is there one? You come. You come. In his presence. Across the aisle, if you will, connect with someone as we prepare for the benediction this morning. Thank you for your presence today, and I trust God has spoken to your heart and encouraged you as we will assemble for worship today to our visitors and guests. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you on your travel back to Florida. God bless you anyway. God bless you. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you. Even this morning, we see your sovereignty at work, even in the midst of the world we live in. And we are so grateful and so glad that we serve an almighty God. <laughs> and there's nothing that you cannot do. So, Father, use us. Because you are so great and so mighty, use us. Because you're omnipotent, you reign of supreme, God, use us. That we might be your witnesses indeed. First and foremost, on our knees. May you see our heart. And Father, where our heart fails us, God, would you create us, create within us a clean heart. Give us a renewed spirit and a renewed mind. Take the junk out, take the trash out in the name of Jesus. And I pray this uh, uh, globally for all of God's people. I pray, oh God, that you would flush our system, that we might truly have the heart of Christ. I realize, God, that these words, this message... Uh, uh, might get into the hearts of some and might fall by the wayside in others but I pray oh God that the Holy Spirit of God will continue to nudge and, 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 and urge and, and knock on that door until it gets in that our lives all of us might be fully devoted to your purpose in the earth you have a purpose for us you have a plan for us may it be accomplished every day of our lives until we see you face to face and then we'll hear your words say, your voice say, well done, good and faithful servants. Help us to be just that indeed. Bless us now with your benediction. May your peace guard our hearts and minds. May you go before us and lead the way. And may you give us favor, Father, with God and man, as we endeavor to do what you called us to do. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 And amen. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night.